Thanks for joining this episode of the number 86 lecture series, where we discuss doctrine and theory in contract law. Today's episode features Todd J. Zwicky, who is George Mason University Foundation Professor of Law at George Mason University Antonin Scalia School of Law, Research Fellow of the Law and Economics Center, and former Executive Director of the GMU Law and Economics Center. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Contract law is a 1L class. What assumptions do the students start with? How does contracts compare to other first-year courses? Is there anything that students find difficult or surprising? In many ways, contracts are is the most surprising class for first years because most people think they know what a contract is. What you soon find out as soon as you step into law school is a contract isn't just what's written down on a piece of paper that you sign. Contract law has a whole body of concepts, definitions, um, and hundreds of years of history behind it that condition what's in that written agreement. Um, things that may seem very clear may in fact be ambiguous um, or unclear what they mean when you try to operationalize them to a particular dispute that might arise between, uh, between people. And the, mo the most important thing I think is, is that except for very, very simple contracts, every contract is going to have holes in it. Anything that has any degree of complexity, issues could arise six months from now, a year from now, three years from now, um, under the contract. And that's then where the art of a lawyer comes in to try to figure out what the contract is, what the contract means, and how to fill in those gaps in the contract in a way that makes sense. Also somewhat eye-opening, I think, for a lot of law students, especially those who come straight out of college, um, that if you've kind of been out, especially if you've run a business, for example, uh, you may start to understand some of these things about the way in which people don't just always perform on their promises, uh, where conditions might change and people might want to try to renegotiate a contract in goodwill or, or not in goodwill. Um, and this is one of the things that a good law student learns is to not understand the law of contracts, but understand the economics of contracts. Understand why the parties wrote the contract the way they did, and what would be the implications um, if a court does not enforce a contract the way the parties uh, did. It's really important to understand the underlying logic, um, which may not be obvious at first glance, of what the parties were trying to accomplish to make sure that you're going to be arguing and judges are going to be deciding cases that help people plan their, their affairs better in the future rather than basically throwing sand in the gears. You mentioned that some contract definitions have hundreds of years of history. The study of the historical common law is a theme that connects many of the foundational law school classes. Can you give us a quick overview of common law and why it's important? Contracts are in many ways the cornerstone of the Anglo-American legal system, which we think of as the common law. The reason is, is that contracts are both the system by which people pursue their own individual interest, but it's also the essence of the free market economy and capitalism, which has been the engine for prosperity and liberty in the Western world. In many ways, the common law system is a bit of a surprise, I think, to most law students, which is we think of law as something where you go and you look up a statute or a rule in, uh, or something issued by, a, by Congress or a regulatory agency, but the common law is judge-made law. And what is so great about the common law is the common law arises from individual disputes between private citizens who have some sort of conflict. Um, and so by and large, the common law leaves you alone if you are just um, pursuing your goals in a cooperative way with the other uh, people around you. Um, and so, and then when you do get into conflict with somebody, the common law basically tries to provide a pragmatic solution to that that is fair and just and basically realizes people's expectations of what is expected of them in society. The common law is a somewhat unique system that arose in England, um, beginning with the Norman Conquest, really, but really throughout the Middle Ages it evolved out of um, private dispute 
uh, resolution. Um, there was a common law system in Europe, but it basically got preempted by Napoleon, who turned the whole system into what we call a civil law system focused on legislation um, and the legislature being the primary actor. In England, the common law basically represents these dispute resolution process between private parties, and that's what we imported into the United States. And many of uh, American states or colonies, the first rule that they enacted was basically a rule that continued the English common law into the colonies and adopted it as our governing framework for law in the United States. Of course, once the common law came to the United States, we added our own additions to it, but it's really quite striking the extent to which, when you're sitting in a first year contracts class, for example, um, you will read plenty of cases from England and plenty of cases from the United States. The concepts are pretty much the same. Um, and there's an underlying logic to the common law that transcends national boundaries. So while legislative law or regulatory law varies very much from country to country, it's what we call positive law, the common law and the common law concepts are kind of universal to all the countries that have a common law system, whether it's England, India, the United States, or various other British colonies, Canada, Australia, you name it. That's a good summary of what the common law is and where it came from. Can you say more about how we study it or how we use it to determine the merits of a case? You can think of the common law case analysis system is having three different levels of analysis. There's the facts, which are critically important to the common law. As you will discover in law school, cases turn on the particular facts of particular disputes that arise between different people. Then you have what we can think of as the conceptual level, which is a body of concepts, uh, to give you some examples from contract law, concepts like consideration, offer and acceptance, um, warranties, all these sorts of things that grew up as ways of operationalizing the common law in a coherent set of concepts. And then above that or behind that, sometimes articulated, sometimes unarticulated, are a set of policies. Um, and those policies um, are often economic in nature. Um, that what we really see is what seems to be the animating um, force of the common law is a desire to promote social coordination in society, to allow people to basically pursue their goals with a minimum of friction, um, and a maximum of cooperation and ability to plan their objectives. And what is so special about contract law, the essence of contract law is it allows us to plan for the future which is it allows us to plan a year, two, five years from now. Think of it this way. Think of if every day you showed up for law school, the professor might be there or the professor might not be there. The doors might be open, the doors might not be open. It'd be like walking into a Starbucks every day and just making a transaction across the counter. The whole system of contracts is what allows people to plan the next year of their life, the next three years of their life, to get a job, to be employed, and all those sorts of things that follow from that. That development of this abstract idea of contract and the ability that allows ordinary individuals to plan their futures is a very powerful uh, force. And that's what the underlying logic of contract law is. It allows people to plan their futures as efficiently as possible. So the purpose of contract law is to enable people to cooperate and to plan. Say more about how contracts fit in the common law framework as you've described it. Contracts, in my view, is the best way to think about uh, the common law and the, uh, and the most coherent way of thinking about how to think like lawyers. There are these three different levels of analysis that are implicit or, or often explicit in every case, which is the idea of policy, which is what is the social goal a certain rule is trying to accomplish. There are the legal doctrines, um, uh, such as consideration, offer, and acceptance, and the like. And there are the facts of the particular case. Now, what's very interesting is most law students think that second level is what law school is about, which is the rules and the doctrines. It turns out that's the easy part of law school. What is challenging um, and what separates a good lawyer who can think like a lawyer from a bad lawyer who can't is 
which is understanding which of those three levels of analysis is important in any given case and being able to move back and forth among those levels of analysis through a narrative framework that basically presents a compelling case to a judge or jury or whoever a third party might be. I think one of the most surprising things that law students learn early in law school and in many ways is the difference between a layman's understanding of contract law and a lawyer is most people think of a contract as a promise to do something. In fact, contract law says a contract is a promise to perform an obligation or to pay damages if you don't. Or more precisely, as Oliver Wendell Holmes put it in one famous case, a contract is an obligation to pay damages, and that obligation can be discharged by performing the contract. So what does this tell us? That the essence of contract is paying damages rather than actually performing the, the promise. What is the logic of damages? Damages is the idea that you can either get a performance from this particular person, or if you can get the performance from somebody else, then you get the performance from that third party, and the party who breaches the contract has to pay you damages in order to do that. At common law, the idea of specific performance, which is forcing somebody to actually perform what they have promised to do, is the exception rather than the rule. The standard remedy is contract damages. Specific performance is only in specific situations where you would not be fully compensated by receiving damages. What might that be? For example, a unique good, such as a Van Gogh painting, where you can't figure out what an alternative would be for a Van Gogh painting, or a unique antique car, for example. But if you just bought a new Ford F-350 truck, um, and the dealer you've dealt with doesn't come through with the contract, you can go get a Ford F-350 truck from somebody else that is not the exact same truck, but good enough, basically identical for purposes of contract law, and the presumption is that you would get the replacement performance and the party that breaches would pay you damages rather than you being actually able to enforce the contract as written. Contracts is in many ways the king of the common law, uh, which is that the entire sort of society of freedom and free markets in the Western world is predicated on the idea of freedom of contract and that people are autonomous uh, individuals who can control their lives, pursue their own uh, goals. Um, and contracts is really the essence of that system of private ordering and individual liberty. Can you give us an example of a foundational case that illustrates key legal concepts in contracts? One of the key ideas of contract is a contract exists to minimize the cost of parties entering into reciprocal uh, promises. Um, that involves providing default rules uh, for the standard terms that parties might want for a contract, but it also embodies an idea called the mitigation principle, which is that if the contract falls apart later on, you want to try to resolve that uh, problem at minimal cost. Now, why does that matter? Again, the idea here is the Coase theorem. Um, the basic idea is, is that when you enter into a contract, both parties are expecting the contract's going to work out well for them. If it turns out that it doesn't, then you don't know which party that's going to be who's gonna be the one who's gonna to wanna to get out of the contract. So the assumption of contract law is, is that at the time you enter into the contract, neither party knows whether or not they're likely to be the party that might wanna breach or the party that might be the victim of the breach. And so what would they want as their standard terms? They would want the terms that encourage them to minimize damages at the time of the breach. So here's a classic case, a case called Hoekster versus Delatour. This is a 19th century English case where there was this fellow who was going to um, go off with some English baron uh, to Europe and travel around for the summer. Well, it turns out the baron changed his mind um, and told uh, Hoekster, your services are no longer necessary. What did uh, uh, Mr. Hoekster do? He went out and he got himself employed by somebody else. Um, another baron who was going to, uh, to Europe. When the time came around where theoretically they were gonna to go to Europe together, Hoekster was no longer available. What did Mr. Delatour do? 
he said, I don't owe you anything because you went off with this other, uh, this other baron. Um, what did the court say? The court said, no, that makes no sense. That once the breach occurs, Hoekster should not only be allowed, he should be encouraged to get alternative um, uh, work rather than just sitting around twiddling his thumbs waiting for the inevitable, which is for De La Tour to tell him that he doesn't need his services anymore. That's a good example of contract law providing a mitigation principle, which is that in that case, De La Tour is trying to get himself a windfall, um, but over the long run, what would parties want? They'd want a rule that not only allowed, but encouraged guys like Hoekster to go out and get alternative work so that he was being productive for the economy, minimizing the damages uh, that he would otherwise uh, um, cause to De La Tour. Let's talk more about how we see the system of contracts working in society. What examples do you use for your students? Is a formal contract necessary for every transaction? Oftentimes, what the common law really is, is applied intuition. And your intuitions are often shaped by the facts. And merely by living kind of in, a, in, a, in an organized society, we start to pick up sort of what is expected of different people in terms of what degree of honesty, what degree of uh, promise keeping, what kind of contracts will be enforced and which ones won't. So for example, a promise made in the context of a family, say a parent promising to take their kid to the playground, is very different from a promise made in a market setting such as contracting with a, uh, a daycare who will promise to take your kid to, uh, to, um, to, to the playground. The former, if you don't take your kid to the playground, doesn't lead to a breach of contract claim. The latter, in theory, could because the latter creates an enforceable contract, the former does not. And so understanding why that context matters, and it does matter a lot, that's sort of the underlying logic of, uh, of the, the common law and the storytelling part of it, that intuitively, you know those are different uh, uh, situations. Understanding the law and understanding the underlying logic of the law can take that intuition and explain why that is. Contracts cover everything from the cup of coffee you buy today, which may not, it's Starbucks, which may not look like a contract, but has a whole network of uh, promises embedded in that transaction from the idea that, uh, that, the, that the coffee is going to um, you know, be healthy for you, right? That it won't be uh, uh, adulterated. All the way through to complex contracts for software development, uh, recording contracts, um, contracts to manufacture things, put them on ships, uh, load them from ships, distribute them, if something goes wrong with it, there are systems of warranties to govern what your rights are in terms of uh, if a product turns out to be defective uh, and the like. And most of the time, we're not even aware of this. It's kind of like a, a, a software program that runs in the background uh, um, without you ever becoming aware of it. Um, and that's the genius of the common law is it provides this whole system of default rules that allow you to engage in these complex transactions without even thinking about it, but at the same time allows you to tailor those rules to fit whatever your circumstances are. You can think of writing a contract as being like buying a suit. You can walk into, say, Macy's or Brooks Brothers, and you can just get a suit off the rack you know, in fairly standardized size. It'll fit people pretty well most of the time. Maybe you have to have the cuffs taken up or, uh, you know, the, the, the pants hemmed. But mostly it works for you with some nips and tucks around the end. Or you can invest a lot of money. You can go to Savile Row and get a custom-made suit that costs a couple thousand rather than a couple hundred dollars that fits you perfectly. And what we see is that's the flexibility that contract law gives you. For simple, ordinary transactions, it's like an off-the-rack suit where you could take the terms and it saves you all the trouble of hashing that out and negotiating it. Or if you're going to do some sort of complex you know, transaction, whether a merger and an acquisition, for example, of a multi-billion dollar company or software development thing or making a movie or something like that, there may be all kind of 
specialized terms and conditions that you want to, uh, to, to include in that. Contract law is flexible enough to do both of those at once to provide off the rack default rules as well as the freedom to be able to create your own custom made rules if you're willing to go to the additional hassle and the difficulty of doing that. Contracts, especially complex arrangements as you described, are premised on the assumption that a court would uphold the agreement. Should law students think about contracts primarily in the context of court decision? Interestingly, the root of the word credit is credere, which in Latin means trust. And that tells you something about what contracts are about. Contracts are about trust. Why does trust matter so much? Why is it so important that virtually every promise in society, including economic promises, are kept without anybody ever having to go to court, even if one party is somewhat disappointed in how the contract turned out? The reason is, is because contract law should be seen as a backstop. Um, it should be seen as a last resort when parties don't follow through on what they've promised to do. 99.99% .99 of the time they do, contract law stands for those situations in which you can't rely on people to do the right thing for the right reasons. One of the common flaws, I think, of many contracts professors, scholars, and law students is that they think of contract as being the entire world of promise keeping, rather than understanding that contract law is a particular promise enforcement technology that should be used sparingly in particular situations. Why is that? Because it's a very expensive system. It's publicly subsidized. Lawsuits are, are, are expensive. Uh, they're rancorous. Um, and more litigation is not good for society. And so for the wheels of commerce to, to, to move easily, for capitalism to survive, it really rests on the idea that most of the time parties are gonna do what they say they are going to do and what they've promised to do. And we need to make sure that contract law doesn't overwhelm all those systems of private ordering. Um, but at the same time, we need to make sure that contract law does enforce legal obligations um, when they need to be enforced. And we don't have courts coming in and rewriting contracts according to what they think is their sense of fairness or justice or something like that that may be contrary to what the parties intended. Thank you for listening to this episode of the number 86 lecture series on contract law. The spirit of debate of our founding fathers animates all of the number 86 content, encouraging discussion and critical reflection relative to how each subject is widely understood and taught in law schools and among law students. Subscribe to the number 86 lecture series on your favorite podcast platform to have each episode delivered the moment it's released. You can also go to fedsoc.org slash number 86 for lectures and videos on federalism, separation of powers, the judiciary, and more. Thanks for listening. See you in class.